Okay. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dorothy Keeser. She's been a certified master gardener for many years. She brings to the library seminars her scientific approach from her career as a biologist, as well as a wealth of experience from her own extensive home orchard, vegetable, flower, and rhododendron gardens. In addition to her volunteer work with the master gardeners, Dorothy is an active member of the Bebbin Learning Garden. It's a large local community garden which features a greenhouse and has given numerous seminars on many gardening topics to gardening clubs and associations. Dorothy is the past president of Vancouver Island Master Gardener Chapter, uh, VIMGA, and is currently the lead mentor for the Advanced Master Gardeners course given jointly by Vancouver Island University and Vancouver Island Master Gardeners. All right, over to you, Dorothy. Well, thank you for that intro, Darby. It's always amazing to, to hear about oneself and a bit strange, but never mind. Um, good evening, all of you out there. And uh, I want to focus, of course, on my favorite vegetables and tell you a little bit about how I grow them and hope that works well for you. Um, this afternoon I was out in my garden and I harvested some endive for supper and yesterday I was in my garden and harvested some leek and it's such a joy to go out at any time of the year in our wonderful climate um, and to be able to do that and so I hope you have that same experience and pleasure in going out into your garden and harvest not necessarily in the middle of winter although at 11 degrees, hardly middle of winter, but um, I hope that you get some joy out of gardening as much as I do maybe. Um, and with that, I'll uh, launch into my talk. So I will talk about my favorite vegetables. And that's a very hard thing to do to pick favorites because I like nearly all vegetables. But because we have a limited amount of time, I of course had to make some choices. And so the choices for me are truly the ones I like the best or that grow the best in my garden. And so I have eliminated things like carrots. Not that I don't love carrots, they're wonderful. And especially if they come fresh out of the garden, maybe you eat them soil and all, it doesn't really matter because they're wonderful no matter, but they're relatively inexpensive and easy to get in the store. The same for onions. I find onions a bit difficult to grow and, uh, and also quite inexpensive at the store. So those are things that you will not find in my talk today. The other thing you will not find uh, are indeed a few vegetables that I don't particularly care for, and okra happens to be one of them, uh, even though it is now in the seed catalogs. So many, many vegetables grow wonderfully well here, and I will focus on some of them. Uh, before I do that, I have to, uh, let's see that uh, I can do, do that. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Darby has already shown you the regional library uh, logo. So, and she told you that I'm Dorothy Keezer, certified master gardener. The main thing here is that uh, this partnership with the Vancouver Island Regional Library means that the talks are edu um, meant, intended for educational purposes and not for commercial use. But beyond that, um, I hope you enjoy it and go for it. So I'll go on to some of the basics. And some of the basics I want to talk about is dreaming and planning your garden. And when I say dreaming, I know full well that this is the season when all the gardening catalogs come out and there's all these luscious vegetables and you want to plant every last one of them. But you have to do some planning because your garden is not likely to be enormous, nor are you likely to want to eat all of the stuff that they have uh, for offer, like the okra that I was already mentioning. Um, so dreaming and planning is absolutely essential. I won't spend a great deal of time on summer versus winter vegetables, but I will mentioning, mention it. Then there's some goals about how much you should grow. Then I want to talk a little bit about quality seed. And most importantly, in any good garden is spacing. So I'll spend a little bit of time on spacing. But first of all, let's go on to uh, planning and preparing. 
And, uh, and one of the key things is since all of us have limited space, we have to make the best use of our garden beds. Maybe we only have one raised bed, maybe we have several, it doesn't really matter. So you have to plan the succession. And let me just go into that a little bit because it also um, refers to the timing of, uh, of what to plant when. So at that top, picture that you see there that says crop succession, it comes straight from Linda Gilkes, one of Linda Gilkeson's books. And if you don't have any of Linda Gilkeson's books, I highly recommend that you get them either from the library or because you'll want to refer to them again and again that you get your very own copy. So when you look at that particular image, you see the same bed throughout the season. So in the first one, you see it's full of lettuce, absolutely wonderful. First crop that you can plant in the spring is lettuce. And then as you're eating the lettuce, of course you get some space. And that's when the succession comes in. What do you do with that space? Well, put your little cucumber plants in. And then as you have less and less lettuce, the cucumbers have actually room to grow. And then when the lettuce is all gone, the cucumbers are big but not filling the whole bed, then it's time to put in your bigger vegetables that you might want to harvest in the winter. So like kale or winter broccoli or something like that. And then the last picture, number five, shows that the cucumbers are gone, it's fall, and here is a lovely big uh, space for the kale that you want to have either in the winter, fall, winter, or even overwintering. So that's the key to crop, um, crop succession, but you can only do that if you've planned accordingly. So think about the planning and the timing. The timing is absolutely key. So on the bottom image, you see what West Coast Seed has put out, and it really doesn't matter which uh, crop you're looking at, but whether it's a head cabbage or kale or broccoli, winter cauliflower, let's look at it. So in the row that says summer, you start your seeds, that's the green part, start indoors. You start your seeds in about March, April. And then when they're a nice, good sized seedling, then at the end of April, May, maybe at the beginning of June, you outplant them. And then by the time July, August, September rolls around, you'll eat the summer crop. Very similar for the fall crop. You started a little bit later in March, April, outplant more or less at the same time, but the variety that you've chosen then will be ready for eating in September, October, November. And going on, the same for the winter. And lastly, for the overwintering crop, you don't start that until July, June, July, outplant it, and you want to have a good size plant so that uh, it gets a good start, outplant it in late August, September, and then it's just growing happily, and then eventually it'll just sort of sit there, and then come February, March, April, then you start to harvest your overwintering crop. So for instance, when I'll talk about the sprouting broccoli later on, that's what I'm going to be harvesting in another uh, few months time. Right now, I'm harvesting my overwintering leek. So that's um, just a word on varieties, and I'll point that out as I get to the individual crops, that it's very important that if you do want to have a winter garden, that you choose the right varieties, because not every variety is going to be suitable. Not every variety has the right amount of antifreeze, so to speak, in its uh, foliage, so it might not survive the winter. But there are many varieties of various plants that uh, do very well throughout the winter. And with that, I'll go on to the spacing. Because planning your space is absolutely essential. And uh, these two tables come from a seminar series that was hosted by West Coast Seed and demonstrated by Jordan Mara of Mind and Soil and their companies at Squamish. So let's look at that um, item number two, draw your space. So think of your garden or your individual beds better 
as uh, being in square feet. There's actually books that talk about square foot gardening, but you can just do that in pencil and paper. So think of each little square as one square foot. So draw out how big your bed is, and then decide you've already decided in your dreaming and planting, planning what you want to plant. So say you wanted to plant tomatoes. Then you go to uh, the space planner table and you look under tomatoes and you see that one plant, one plant needs two squares. Well, I would be generous. One plant might even need three squares, it depends what kind of tomato. Or if you go, for instance, for squash, then you have to have four squares for each plant. So draw out your bed and see what you want to plant in there at what time and how much space it takes. Of course, smaller plants, and let's look at lettuce, for instance, each square can easily hold four plants. Or if you're looking at basil, again, each square has plenty of room for four plants. So go to that table and, uh, and then plant, uh, plan out your space, plan out the succession, and it's a, it takes a fair bit of time um, to actually do that. This is not a simple exercise, but uh, it's a well worthwhile exercise. The other thing that you need to keep in mind as far as the planning your space is concerned is that you want to um, put things that go well together in the same bed at the same time. So. Um, for instance, water requirements. Different plants have very different water requirements. So for most herbs, for instance, don't need much in the way of water at all. So plant your herbs all in the same area, then you can control the water appropriately. But things like cucumbers, for instance, and uh, squashes and pumpkins need a fair bit of water. So put those together and give them the appropriate amount of water. So plant things that have the same requirements. Also sun-wise, plant things that like a lot of sun together in your sunniest space. Things like lettuce and so on that need less um, sun, you can plant in a space that doesn't get quite as much sun. And lastly, in terms of planning, think of interspersing pollinator plants with your vegetables. Not only does it look pretty, if you have the odd sunflower here or there, it really attracts the bees and then they help pollinate your zucchini or help pollinate whatever else needs pollinating tomatoes, for instance. Um, so it's well worthwhile to plant a few pollinator plants in between. And then think of other beneficial insects. You also want to plant some plants for those. And when I'm talking about other beneficial insects, I'm talking about things like uh, parasitic wasps. And there the adults need tiny, tiny flowers because then um, they have to feed, of course, and then they can let, uh, lay their eggs where you have aphids or cutworms or whatever. And uh, it really makes a difference in terms of keeping the pests under control. So when I'm talking about plants that have tiny, tiny flowers, I'm thinking about alyssum. It's well worthwhile to plant a few alyssum plants in your tomato bed or plant some dill, which has very small flowers, fennel, and uh, all those things are excellent suggestions to intersperse in your planning. Now, from that, I want to go on to seeds. And uh, what I really want to stress is um, that you want to get local sources. Because if you look at garden catalogs that come from far away, they're not necessarily meant for our climate. So when I'm talking about local sources, of course there's West Coast seed and they have wonderful uh, varieties and there are a textbook of information. So if you don't have any other gardening book, get yourself a West Coast Seed Gardening Guide and it tells you everything that you need to know about when to start, how deep to plant the seeds, how far apart to plant them, all these things, wonderful. But there is a whole range of uh, local seed companies that uh, grow their own seed that are wonderful, certainly for the Vancouver Island and coastal um, BC climate. Yeah, I was at the uh, Qualicum Seedy Sunday on the weekend and it was wonderful. I must have seen at least 
eight different local seed sources. And I'm just showing a few here, salt spring seeds, sandwich organics, full circle seeds, but there was a whole bunch of others. So go to your local CD Sunday and pick up some of the local seeds because they really are there because they do so well in our climate. Um, and then I wanted to say, look, if start over. Um, if you want to save your own seeds, that's a wonderful thing to do. But not all seeds, not all plants are such that they are the same that are true to seed from generation to generation. So when you if you do want to save your own seed, make sure that you look at the packages or the catalog to see that it says open pollinated. Open pollinated means that the bees can come and go and pollinate and you will have the next generation true to seed. While if you get plants that are labeled F1 or F1 hybrid, then they will not likely come true to seed. They may for a generation or so, but the hybrids may turn out to be quite different in the next generation. And so again, if you want to save seed, make sure that you get the open pollinated ones. And then as I've already mentioned, look, if you're wanting to have a winter garden, make sure that you look at uh, plants that or seeds that are specifically for plants that are, um, can stand our winter. And with that, I've done sort of the um, theoretical uh, part of the talk. And now I'll go on to my actual favorite vegetables. And the way I've arranged it is not in alphabetical order or not in size or grouping. It's simply by time of year that you want to start them. And so this is why I'm starting with broad beans, because in another, I would say three weeks or so, as soon as the soil is half workable, that's when you can put your broad beans into the ground. And of course, I realize that not everybody is a broad bean aficionado like I am, but I think they have various fantastic benefits. Um, the first of all is they're good to eat. And especially if you can get the red flowered um, broad beans and you can, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, the red flowers are particularly tender and they're particularly beautiful. So if you can get some of the red flowering broad beans, then that's a real bonus. There are other varieties like uh, Windsor, for instance, which are okay too, but uh, not nearly as nice as the red flowering ones. And you can see how prolific they are. Look at the picture on the right. They are so prolific. And I like um, harvesting when I see the good seed pod, but not too, not too hard um, so that they're nice and fresh and green. And, but a few words of warning as far as broad beans are concerned, they do need to be staked. They grow up to be about three to four feet tall and uh, they would fall over if you didn't have them staked. Now, the nice thing about broad beans and of course other legumes, and so I'll just mention it in the broad beans, is that they fix nitrogen. So wherever you've grown a legume and broad beans are particularly nice that way, um, the soil is actually enriched with nitrogen through the nitrogen fixing bacteria on the um, roots and root hairs of the plant. So when I'm done with my broad beans, which usually happens in about, oh, end of May, beginning of June, then I don't take the plant out. I just cut the plant off at soil level. And that way the roots stay in and the nitrogen stays in and whatever you plant next, and that's where the crop succession comes in, whatever you plant next will really benefit from the nitrogen that's in the soil from the fixing. Now, moving on to the next thing that you need to get going, uh, the broad beans, of course, you can start directly in the ground. But there's many things that I will mention that are wonderful to grow in our area, but they're warm weather crops. And so you need to start them indoors. And starting indoors is lovely. I won't go into the details of it, um, but you do need a heat mat and you need a grow light. Otherwise, you're not going to have a very successful harvest. So you want to start your peppers in about, oh, middle of March at the very early March is actually better. 
Then if you find that too much trouble to start your own transplants, then buy them from a, from a reputable place and look for them that they're in good health and, and lovely to look at. Um, but if you do want to start them yourself, then you do need that, um, you do need the grow light and the heat mat. So because they, in order to start them appropriately, they have to be in the mid twenties. Let me just let my cat in. Mm -hmm. Um, otherwise it's going to drive me crazy. Anyway, the, the temperature of the soil has to be in the mid twenties. And so they should be started. Um, try that again. The soil temperature for out planting should be in the mid twenties for starting the seed. It should be somewhere in the low twenties with the nighttime temperatures a bit lower. And uh, for maximum fruit production, you really want to have them be um, nice and big by about the middle of May so that you can outplant them when the soil temperature is warm enough. The other thing about peppers is they want plenty of calcium and phosphorus. And so you'll be wanting to add uh, some compost and some complete organic fertilizer. And when I'm talking about complete organic fertilizer, you can make your own and there's recipes around for that. Um, but I personally, time is limited. So I buy mine and the, the stuff I buy is called Gaia Green. And um, I buy the 444 and put that into the planting hole um, as I'm putting my seedling in. So one other thing I want to say about anything that you start with, um, with transplants rather than starting seed directly in the ground, and that is hardening off. I don't have a diagram for hardening off, but basically when you think about it, it's like you going to Hawaii in the middle of winter and sitting on the beach without any sun protection. Well, you'd be burning pretty quickly. And the same is true for vegetables if they're not hardened off. They need not only to be hardened off for the sun, but they also need to develop a better root system. And so what I suggest you do is when you buy your seedlings or when your own seedlings are ready to be put out, give them a few days in mild sunshine, take them out for a few hours, bring them back in. That way they get the wind and the sun. That means they develop a stronger cuticle um, that protects the sun, protects them from the sun, and they develop a better root system. And so you have a much better plant as you're, uh, as you're going on. Now, this, my screen's already decided I need to move on to leek. And uh, leek is an absolutely wonderful vegetable and it comes in summer and winter varieties. And as I was saying, you have to really look at the seed catalogs to see which one you want. And uh, if you want a summer leek and they can be wonderful, um, I would suggest that Varna is a good choice. But for myself, I prefer the winter varieties. I have so many summer vegetables that I absolutely adore that, um, that I buy the seed for winter varieties and specifically um, banded. It grows best in my garden. It's slow and, uh, and is ready. As I say, I just harvested some last week. Um, in order to have a nice crop of leek, of course, most of us like the white part of the leek the best, although you can use the green in soups and whatnot. Um, I dig a fairly deep trench. I try again. I start them indoors. And when they're about pencil sized, then I feel they're ready to be outplanted into the garden. And so I dig a fairly deep trench and I put my pencil sized transplants in there. And as they get established, I start filling the trench and I start filling the trench. And then that gives me a fair bit of lovely white edible leek material um, that I can harvest when time comes. So the, my favorite variety, Bandit for winter leek and Varna for summer leek. Moving on to fennel. I don't know how many of you have tried growing the bulb fennel. It's a wonderfully tasty, crunchy vegetable with a slight anise or licorice taste. It's lovely in salads, but it's also very nice cooked or stir fried. 
it's a fairly slow growing vegetable. It takes about 80 days from seed to harvestable bulbs. And the seeds germinate at about 15 to 21 degrees. So for early crops, you might want to start them indoors in individual pots and, uh, and then outplant them when the soil temperature is uh, sort of in the lower 20s. Or if you want to have a later crop, then wait until the soil temperature is appropriate and, um, and then seed them directly into the ground. The other thing is fennel needs a fair bit of room. So give them at least a ruler length, 30 centimeters between the plants um, to let them develop appropriately. And variety wise, my favorite variety by far is the Selma Fina bulb. Now those were two vegetables that um, you might want to start indoors. But the peas are a vegetable that I start directly outdoors because they can go into, the seed can go into the ground just about, oh, middle of March or so, and they'll be perfectly good. Um, and, be, and they're fast growers and they're just a delightful crop. I personally prefer to grow the um, the sweet pea, uh, try that again, the sugar peas rather than the shelling peas because I hate to waste any green material that I've grown. So I, I, I like the, um, the sugar peas. And here, the variety you see here is a variety called Banana Nano. And they get to be quite big and they do not have many strings and they stay nice and tender even when they're at least the size of your hand. So if you can find some banana nano seeds, that is an absolutely wonderful variety. But there's other good varieties like uh, Oregon Giant. And uh, the Oregon Giant in particular is not as susceptible to some of the viruses that you get when the weather gets hot. So the peas like to be in a cool, somewhat shady spot. And so plan your garden accordingly. But they're wonderful vegetable, both fresh or in salads or uh, cooked, frozen, you can hardly get enough peas. From peas, I move on to potatoes. And uh, even though I said before I, that I uh, don't want to talk a lot about vegetables that are relatively inexpensive, I think it's worth growing at least a few potatoes because they are so lovely and there are so many different varieties and colors. Um, these ones are called French fingerlings, but there's my favorite ones are Siglind or uh, Yukon Gold. The French fingerlings are cute, as you can see here, but there are so many small ones. And the drawback of growing potatoes, especially small potatoes, is wire worms and flea beetles. So if you leave any potato seed in the ground, then they are a marvelous attractant for the wire worms that turn into flea beetles later on. In terms of how I grow the potatoes, because I do have to grow a few, we're great potato lovers, um, is I dig, I loosen the soil up considerably and then put either the single drop or the, the seed piece in. When I say single drop, those are the small potatoes that, uh, that have one or two eyes and don't need to be cut. If I'm talking about the cut potatoes, the, then you want to have one or two eyes and plant that into the ground. So I loosen my soil, I add some organic fertilizer, then I cover the potatoes lightly, and then I mulch. And you can see here on the picture that I mulch with, uh, with straw or hay. And I make the mulch at least six inches um, in thickness, and maybe even more depending on if I see any poke out through the mulch, then I might um, make the mulch even a bit thicker. Um, they do need, potatoes do need a fair bit of nutrition in the soil and they need to have a bit of space. So you should have one seed piece with a single drop or cut potato per foot, and then you should have at least four to five feet between rows. And the last word of advice as far as potatoes are concerned is it's okay to save your own, but if you're in an area that has any uh, virus diseases, 
you're much better off in terms of production if you buy certified virus-free seed. And so each year I tend to um, buy the, my new seed potatoes. And from potatoes, we move on to tomatoes. There are so many wonderful, luscious fruit. There are big ones and little ones, green ones and yellow ones and almost black ones, and of course, red ones and striped ones. So let me just talk about a few uh, of the tomatoes that I grow and really like. Um, unfortunately, my the rest of my family doesn't like anything but bright red tomatoes. So I have to sneak in a few other colors. And uh, so one of my favorite tomatoes, which is um, green zebra, doesn't find that much uh, love in my family. But let's look at the ones that I've, I'm showing here. And of course you have cherry tomatoes and mid-sized tomatoes and on and on different seasons. And so let's look at these ones here, the black cherry tomatoes, very flavorful, very productive dark, a bit uh, longish, a, a wonderful cherry tomato to have. Moving on in terms of size is you get the Gardener's Delight, which is the size of a mandarin orange or so, maybe a little bit smaller. A little bit bigger is the Mortgage Lifter. All of these are very productive. And the sweetest potato tomato that I know of is the Hawaiian pineapple. Um, beautiful with a red and yellow uh, variegation in it. Um, if you don't have that much room in your garden, or if you have a lot of deer in your garden and you would sooner grow things up where the deer can't reach them, and you want cherry tomatoes, I would suggest you get some hanging basket cherry tomatoes. There are one plant per standard size hanging basket and so prolific. Have a look at how many tomatoes you see in this picture. And so if you have those on your patio, you can be harvesting tomatoes every day. And just as you walk by, you get this little sweet treat of hanging basket tomatoes. A few others that I find particularly nice are the one pound tomatoes. And if you actually weigh those, um, they are easily over a pound. And then a somewhat smaller, very flavorful tomato is the Cherokee purple. Um, the striped Roma is an excellent sauce tomato. And again, very, very prolific, at least in my garden. And then I'm showing some hanging basket tomatoes just for size. Um, a few words about why your tomato crop might be not as good as, um, as your hope. And one of them, of course, is having poor starts, and I'll go into that in the next slide. But the other, of course, is weather conditions. Um, we all know about the blight. Um, you can have late blight or early blight, which are fungus infections, different fungus infections. And they get particularly noticeable if um, the leaves are wet for any length of time. So when you're growing your tomatoes, it's well worthwhile to think about your watering system being um, a system that does not spray the tomatoes. So overhead watering for tomatoes is oftentimes a recipe for failure. But if you have a drip system, a soaker hose, anything like that, and then put considerable mulch over the ground, that will keep the leaves nice and dry and you'll have less um, likelihood of fungus. Of course, if we have a very wet spring or very wet summer, then there's nothing that we as gardeners can do. You just have to uh, live with it. But another reason for lack of fruit, not disease wise, but lack of fruit is also caused by weather. And that is if it gets too hot. If it gets too hot, the pollen becomes sterile. So when we have a heat dome and we have uh, 30 degrees and more, the pollen is sterile and then of course no fruit sets. But as soon as it cools down and more pollen is produced, that's not sterile, then you'll have the next set. But you may have a sort of rung of tomatoes that, or a rung of leaves where there's no tomatoes simply because there was no appropriate pollen. 
Um, of course, excess heat and excess sun exposure also can cause some genuine sunburn on the fruit. So do leave some leaves on. Um, there's a school of thought that says, take as many leaves off so that the fruit are all nicely in the sun. Well, that has its drawbacks and uh, because the fruit can get sunburned. And the other thing about the heat is, um, if you have something called blossom end rot, which means that you have a sort of dried out bit at the bottom end of the tomato away from the stalk, it's sort of a papery, brown, ugly patch called, as I say, um, blossom end rot that is caused by a lack of calcium. And so people think, oh good, I'll just put more calcium into the soil, but that doesn't actually do it. The problem is that if you have uneven watering and if it's too hot and the soil dries out, then the plant cannot take up the calcium. There may be plenty of calcium in the soil, but the plant can't take it up and uh, then it doesn't get to where it counts and then you have the blossom end rot. And excess heat can also cause deformed, uh, deformed fruit. But when I'm talking about um, starting tomatoes. Of course, we all know that tomatoes are a warm weather crop. And uh, in order to have the maximum yield, they need to be started indoors. If you start them outdoors, it's too late in the season to have a very good harvest. So you want to start them indoors in April. And I was already talking about having heat mats and grow lights in order to have the best start for making your own seedlings. And that's definitely true for tomatoes. Because what does a tomato seed need when you put it into the ground? It needs moisture. It needs a medium that it can put its roots into. And it needs warmth. It needs a lot of warmth at that particular time. And so if you start your tomato seeds on a windowsill, that's not a good place. Even on top of the fridge where it's nice and warm is a better place to start the seed until something green comes out. And then as soon as you see the first green, then you know the seed has done its thing, it's formed some roots, it's formed the shoot, and then you can move it into a somewhat cooler place. And you might think about the windowsill, but oftentimes even the windowsill does not have it have enough light for it. And you can see the seedling, as in this picture, bend desperately towards the light and it's hoping that it gets enough, um, but it may not get quite enough. So that's where the light comes, the artificial light comes in. Takes about six to eight weeks for the seedling to be of a good enough size for outplanting. That's why I say when you start in middle of March, then by the beginning of May, when it gets a little bit warmer, then you can start thinking about putting your tomato outside, or you might even wait until the May long weekend, which is sort of the magic weekend to put these things out because you want to have the soil temperature to be uh, 15 degrees, 12 to 15 degrees is uh, sort of the minimum that you want in order to have your potato, uh, tomato have a good time outside. And then it's absolutely essential to give your plant enough space once you outplant it. It needs to have such that it does not touch, ideally at least, not touch the leaves of another plant. Again, because you want the air circulation so that the leaves dry off very quickly and you want to have um, you want to make sure that each plant gets enough light, enough sunlight to be really productive. And so my suggestion in terms of growing tomatoes is, I am not a aficionado of tomato cages. I find them oftentimes far too um, weak to support a good size tomato that has a lot of fruit on it. So I personally like growing my tomatoes in a type of espalier. So in the spring before I put my tomatoes outside, I make a trellis like you see here with the um, good size posts in the middle and at either end, and then smaller posts uh, between those um, uprights. And, uh, and then as you plant the tomatoes they, and they grow, then you tie them onto the cross members and they're nicely supported even when they have a very heavy crop. Now there's a few things wrong with this particular picture. It was taken fairly early on. 
first of all, is that the tomatoes don't have enough space for each one, because you see at least four plants here. You see the one that already has red tomatoes, then a middle one that has darker green tomatoes, then you have the striped romas that are sort of oblong, and another round one. They should ideally not be touching because you don't have quite enough air circulation. The other thing that's wrong with this picture is that the uh, soaker hoses or the little uh, spaghetti hoses are not covered by mulch. So there might be some spraying up and you have more evaporation than you ideally want. What's right with this picture is the understory of plants. Here you have some marigolds that are excellent for uh, attracting pollinating insects. And you have your lovely basil that goes with the uh, tomatoes in as far as salads are concerned, right in the same bed so you can harvest at the same time. So that again, since we're moving in the direction of when things need to go in the ground or at least get started, that brings me to lettuce. Now I would, if I could only have one crop in the garden, it would clearly be lettuce. I think that is the most marvelous crop. And there are so many, many different types of lettuces, far too numerous to mention. There's head lettuce and loose lettuce and romaine and dozens of varieties in each category. Um, and I like all of them. But when you look at this picture, you can see um, that it's fairly densely planted. So you see, other than the kale at the top, um, you see the next row is a Merlot loose leaf lettuce, then comes a row of um, Simpson Elite, and another row of Merlot, and then another row of Simpson. And in the bottom row of Merlot, you can actually see where I've taken out alternate heads. So when I plant them, and the plants are so small, I plant too dense for end harvesting. So as the plant grows, I take out alternate plants. So I've taken out some of the more so that there's room. Next, I would be taking out alternate heads of the Simpson, or I might mix them. And then as space allows, I would thin out my kale and plant the kale in the spaces that's there. But really, I want to talk about, about lettuce. So these lettuces probably were seeded in about April. You could even start a little bit earlier. And if you're really good at planning, better than I am, if you're really good at planning, then you could have a fresh crop of lettuce probably from about middle of May, beginning of May, right through September. But you have to choose the varieties accordingly. And you also don't want to have um, excess of lettuce that you just have to compost. Um, so take a small patch of lettuce and, or take a small patch of ground and plant your lettuce. Then take another small patch of lettuce three weeks later, plant a different variety. And so look at the length of time that it takes to maturity and spread them out throughout your garden and you'll have fresh lettuce year round, not year round obviously, but uh, for a considerable length of time throughout the summer. And that brings me to squashes. Now, I think that is an absolutely marvelous fruit, family of fruit, vegetables, whatever you want to call them. The top row has the summer squashes and the winter, the bottom row has the winter squashes. Um, the summer squashes are not keepers. They're lovely throughout the summer in the fried, grilled, you name it. Um, and the winter squashes are I still have lots in my basement. The, the um, trick to storing them is to let the skin really harden in a warm place. And that makes them last a long time. And then there's my all time favorite squash because it's not only very tasty, but it's um, all season squash. And that's the tromboncino in the upper right hand corner. Now I'm about six foot tall and that's me standing there. And just next to me is this long tromboncino. So it's darn near six foot as well. And when you look at it, you can see this long pipe with a bit of a bulb at the bottom. That long pipe is all flesh, not a seed anywhere. The seeds are only in that little bulb at the bottom. And usage wise, 
you can use that uh, long stem pipe, whatever you want to call it, just like you would your regular zucchini, Black Beauty, or any of the others. It's a, a delicious flesh that can be used just fresh as it is. But if you do what I just said in terms of letting the skin harden and ripen so that it be, um, is nice and thick, then it becomes a storage squash. And I still have two or three trombogino stored away that I will use as time goes on as I'm needing more squash. In terms of growing squash, um, again, you'll want to start them probably indoors and then out plant them May long weekend, maybe even June 1st into some fertile soil. And remember what I said earlier about the spacing, you want one plant for four square feet or maybe even a little bit more space. So if you want to start them as, uh, as transplants, especially for the summer squashes, so you beat the season a little bit, start them indoors and then out plant them on the May long weekend. Or if you're not that much in a rush, then put the seeds into the ground on the May long weekend or thereabouts. Related to the squashes, of course, are the cucumbers. And what a wonderful summer vegetable. Um, cucumbers, as I mentioned earlier, need a fair bit of moisture to, to do really well. Um, and they need a fair bit of space. But if your space is somewhat limited, Cucumbers can grow up um, a post or even some string. And on the up picture, is, you can see the string here. Oops, let me go back. There we are. Um, you can grow them up a string and that saves you a great deal of space. Um, so in terms of um, the types of cucumbers, there are many, many different types of cucumbers. My favorite is probably the little muncher. And when I'm talking about little muncher, those are the little lunchbox cucumbers that you see in the store. But the nice thing about the, that particular little muncher is that they're wonderful when they're very small, but they're equally wonderful when they're uh, mature and big and the skin stays nice and soft. And in contrast to the market more, which is also a tasty cucumber, but you really have to peel it because the skin gets so hard. And the Suyu Long is a beautiful, tasty cucumber that I can only highly recommend. A little prickly, but those prickles rub off very easily. And then you can eat it skin and all. Very, very delicious, very flavorful. Um, cucumbers, like the squashes and melons and other things, need a good soil temperature to grow well. Um, and 15 degrees is about the minute. Uh, minimum that they do well in. And they need lots of nutrition and lots of moisture. So I tend to start mine indoors and outplant them when they reach about the three leaf stage. And then, as I say, I grow them up a pole or a string and uh, it's a marvelous summer vegetable to have. But the vegetable that is the most uh, productive for me are beans. And um, of course you can have pole beans or, or um, the low beans, but, um, but personally, because my garden is not that huge, I like growing things up and it really doesn't matter whether I'm talking cucumbers or the squashes, or for that matter, that's why I only do pole beans rather than bush beans. And I don't like bending over, so I don't like picking bush beans either. So a multitude of wonderful pole beans to be had. Um, personally, I'm not that fond of the scarlet runners because the skin is kind of rough. But on the other hand, if you grow scarlet runners, you have the beauty of the uh, red flowers. But the variety I like the best are the Romano type musica beans. So if you can find um, musica beans, that is the one that I personally like growing the best. And they are so prolific. And that's my summer vegetable, winter vegetables, fresh cooked, you name it. Um, you can certainly start the beans straight outside. And so again, May long weekend or thereabouts, June 1st maybe, um, you would put the seeds into the ground. 
But for me, who is continually battling slugs, I prefer to start my seeds indoors. So I start them indoors, oh, around about May 1st. And then when they are at a stage where they're starting to fall over and they really want a pole to climb up on, that's when I plant them outside. And that way the growing tip is out of harm's way of the slugs and they do very well. And I beat the season just a wee bit. So I like starting them indoors, but it's a little more trouble than if you put them straight into the ground. And we're coming just about to the end of my time, um, but I still want to talk a little bit about beans and sprouting broccoli and a few, just a few others. Um, beets, I won't say much about summer beets, but I do want to rave about winter beets. There's a variety called winter keeper or Lutz that gets to be the size of a grapefruit. And I still have a whole a five gallon bucket full of beets in my unheated garage. So in terms of growing them, I start them in about middle of May. And, um, and then um, they just do their own thing. And then just as it starts to have a couple of frosty nights, then I bring them in and they last. But in order to really get them going, sometimes it's a little hard to start uh, vegetables like beets because they have such an incredibly hard seed coat. So if you have plants that have a very hard seed coat, like the beets, for instance, or Swiss chard, then your best bet to have good germination is that you spend an extra day before you want to outplant them and put the seeds between layers of moist paper towel, warm, moist paper towels for 24 hours. And that allows the seed coat to soften and for the seeds to just get that little head start. And then you can plant them into the ground and uh, go from there. Now, in terms of growing them, you can start putting a seed per inch or something like that, maybe per two inches, but beets need room. They really don't like to be touching each other. And so in order to get good sized beets, I put the seeds fairly close because I also don't know about perfect germination, but then as they start to, to uh, grow, then I take out, just like with the lettuce, I take out alternate plants and take out alternate plants and take out alternate plants so that there's always a good amount of soil between the beets themselves. So that to me is a, is a good recipe for growing beets. Soften the seed coat and give them enough room. Um, they can be seeded when the soil temperature reaches, oh, 10, 12 degrees. So somewhere around uh, May, June is an ideal time to start your beets. And now I have to just rave about this vegetable. It's an overwintering vegetable and it's called purple sprouting broccoli. And remember the chart I showed you early on from the West Coast seed catalog? Um, this falls into the overwintering catalog, uh, overwintering category. And I am so fond of it because when I'm desperate for new greens in around February, March, this is what I'll get if I plant sprouting broccoli. Um, so I start the seed in about June. I outplant the little seedlings in about August, in end of July, August, in nice, rich soil, well-drained soil. And then, and then I do nothing further. But give them enough space, just like with the beets that I mentioned, give them enough space so that the leaves don't touch each other. So they need at least four squares uh, per plant and preferably a bit more, especially if your soil is nice and fertile. And then it takes about seven months for the big plant to develop and they get to be about four feet. But once they start making their little purple sprouts, you can't, you, A, you can't resist picking them, but there's also so many of them that they just keep coming and keep coming. So I have to rave about purple sprouting broccoli. Another good all year vegetable is of course, Swiss chard. And uh, there are many, many different varieties of Swiss chard. Um, since we're coming to the end, I just wanted to say 
treat the seeds like what I was just describing for beets. And then it's a question is, do you want beauty or do you want production? Um, if you want beauty, then of course the rhubarb chart that you're seeing here is absolutely stunning. There's the, the seed packages that have a multitude of different stem colors. That's the rainbow or celebration chart. But if you want production, go for Ford Hook, Ford Hook Giant. It will keep you in chard um, all season long. Although I plant some in the spring to eat throughout the summer. And then I plant another batch around about July, August that will keep me in chard um, until the next season. Um, kales are a wonderful vegetable. Um, and they have a life cycle similar to what I just described for the purple sprouting broccoli. And there's so many different types of kale. There's the red Russian, there's the lacinato, there's a beautiful scarlet. This is, picture doesn't do it justice. It really can be stunningly scarlet. But taste wise, from my perspective, that red Russian can't be beat. The lacinato is lovely for kale chips and the scarlet is just pretty. But the red Russian in the spring, just like about the same time that the purple sprouting broccoli comes up and you harvest these little side shoots and the top shoot is the sweetest and tenderest thing that you can possibly imagine. So do, I mean, if you like your kale smoothies and so on, these harder, older leaves are just fine for picking. But man, those little succulent side shoots are exactly the thing that I like to eat. And with that, I've come to the end of the road. And uh, I just wanted to show you a reading list, but I think um, the kind librarians have sent that out to you so that you can look at it in peace. Um, and uh, many, many other good books around. But if you can't, if you can only have two in terms of books that you have to pay for, then get the um, Steve Solomon book growing vegetables west of the Cascades, and by all means, get the Linda Gilkison books. The, um, the West Coast Gardening Guide is free anyway, so you don't have to spend any money, and it's well worthwhile because it tells you so many things about the seed and what kind of seeds to get. And with that, I will take any questions that have accumulated, and I think Darby will uh, tell me the questions, and I'll give the answers as best I can. Okay, we've got lots of questions, which is great. And some people were helping answer each other's questions in the chat, which was very kind too. Um, there were two questions about um, open pollinated. What makes a seed open pollinated and not another? And then somebody else um, said uh, they had an example of what makes an heirloom open pollinated tomato the same genetic makeup, even if you plant it next to something else what prevents it from cross-pollinating and creating a new hybrid? Okay, well, that's a question that comes up um, fairly frequently because it's, it's not that easy in concept to explain. And when we're talking about heritage seed or anything similar to that, it means that those type of plants the particular characteristics have been around a long time and hence the heritage part. And the, all true heritage seeds have to come from what we call open pollinated plants. That means that the um, plant pollinates itself, that it does not have two different parents, it pollinates itself. And consequently, the genetic structure is such that it remains very stable, not identical, but very stable generation after generation after generation. So if I plant, uh, say, a green zebra tomato or what, the hanging basket tomato or all of the others, actually all of what I showed you in my tomato slide, those are all open pollinated. They pollinate themselves and they're stable generation after generation. While if you're looking at a hybrid plant, it needs two different parents. And, uh, and so the next generation, of course, will be a little bit different. Uh, sometimes it leans more towards one type of parent and sometimes it leans more towards the other type of parent. Sometimes it's reasonably similar to the generation before it, but 
as time goes on, those differences will become more and more noticeable. And so the hybrids have many advantages and I don't want to downplay hybrids at all. So if you see a variety in a catalog that says F1 or F1 hybrid, same thing, um, it has oftentimes the disease resistance is particularly good in those hybrids. Sometimes the speed of growing or the temperature regimes and whatnot are, are very, very good in those hybrids, but it's not very um, useful to save seeds from them because you're not likely to get exactly what you had in the previous generation. I hope that answers that question a little bit. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a few questions about um, containers. One of them being, how do bush beans do in pots? That's an interesting question. I would think they do, now I'm truly just making this up because I've never grown bush beans in, pot, in pots, but there's nothing that makes me think that they couldn't be grown in pots in a nice sunny location. Um, and so long as you don't put too many in now, I don't know that I can bring up the, the ch spacing chart, chart that I showed you early on, but um, I would imagine if you have um, say a square foot of pot, let's just assume that for a minute, that you could have four bush beans in there. And, uh, and they might be quite good. Now, the thing with having things in pots, and it doesn't matter whether it's bush beans or any other crop, is that you have to keep on top of the watering. And um, it's much harder to mulch um, in a pot than it is on the soil in an open bed or even a raised bed. And so you have to uh, make sure that you give it external nutrition. So make sure that as you water your pots, you have a regular um, feeding cycle because the plants will use up whatever is in that relatively small amount of soil that you're able to give it. Great, uh, thanks Dorothy. Um, so we had, some of this probably covers uh, about tomatoes. So there was a question about whether you had a particular variety of cherry tomato that you'd recommend for the hanging basket. With the, um, the hanging basket is actually a variety that um, has been perpetuated at the Bevan Learning Gardens in Nanaimo. So I cannot tell you um, where else to find those because it came from one of our members and, uh, and it was open pollinated. They'd had it for many generations. And we at the Bevan Learning Gardens um, have been perpetuating the hanging baskets. And so you won't necessarily find that in any seed catalogs. There are um, non-open pollinated hanging basket type of tomatoes. And I don't have a catalog handy, but if you look in some of the catalogs, like for instance, West Coast Seed, there are some tomatoes that are specifically recommended for hanging baskets, and I'm sure they'll be lovely. Just don't bother to save the seed. Okay, so you guys have your own variety. They can check for a hybrid, or they could get really adventurous and try, try something themselves. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more ticks and tips and tricks on tomatoes and pots? Um, Keep them out of deer's range because it's amazing to me that the deer will eat the tomatoes. That's why I like the, the hanging basket because they can't reach them. But again, the um, make sure that the watering is even so you, you don't get blossom end rot, like I was saying about disturbing the calcium uptake and uh, and again that you feed them. It's amazing how much um, water a tomato in a pot takes and it's amazing how, um, how yeah, the water and the feeding that they, they really run out very quickly. Okay, great. Um, we'll just have uh, one more tomato question um, about sunlight. So you talked about them being sterile, so they won't produce fruit if they're above 30 degrees, but can they be in the direct sun? Can any cherry 
Uh, yeah, that part. Can they be in the direct sun? <laughs> yes, and most vegetables, there's, I mean, things like um, lettuce and some of the other just green vegetables, kale, for instance, don't need as much sunlight, but most things like whether you're talking about tomatoes or um, the squashes or all those type of vegetables really need at least six hours of direct sunlight a day. Eight hours is far better in order for fruit set and for ripening. Great. Uh, we had a question about unheated greenhouse houses and how that fits into your seed starting advice. An unheated greenhouse? Unheated greenhouses. Yes. Um, unheated greenhouses do very well if you have heat mats. You do need the heat mats because as I was saying, the seeds themselves are the portion that needs enough temperature units to actually germinate and not just rot in the moist soil. So for, I think I mentioned a number of temperatures, but oftentimes sort of 20 degrees is sort of the minimum soil temperature that you're aiming for. And so if you can do that via a heat mat, then you do very well, then you don't need to heat the whole greenhouse because the greens themselves, once the seedlings come up, don't need that much heat, but, but you need it to get the seed actually germinating. So I, I had, well, put it this way, the Bebbin Learning Gardens that I already referred to and that make a lot of seedlings for the community, um, there's no heat, no ex excess, heat, not excess, no external heat in the greenhouse, only sun and the heat mats. So we have many beds that have the heat mats for our um, seeds to germinate and that works very well. Uh, great. Uh, another greenhouse question. Somebody is saying that they have issues with mildew in their greenhouse over the winter, asking if you have any suggestions for preventing that. That is a real problem, especially in unheated greenhouses. There's two things. First, you need to have a lot of air circulation and you need to keep watering to an absolute minimum. Plants especially when it's cold, need very, very little in the way of uh, watering moisture in the soil. Mostly what happens is the soil is too wet. People um, look at the seedlings, they're wilting. Oh, what do you do when a seedling wilts? Well, you give it water. And that really means that the soil is too wet and you have them rot away and you have the mildew in the ground. And so keep your greenhouse very dry during the winter and keep a good bit of air circulation. Great. Um, so related question, uh, can you talk about the recommended greenhouse book? I'm thinking it might be the winter harvest handbook. The reviews I read suggest that it's, it is suitable for commercial growers do you think it's useful for home gardeners? I must pass on that question <laughs> because I really don't have much in the way of literature as far as the a greenhouse operation is concerned. So I'm sorry, but that's, uh, you can't cover so, that one. So you think um, that the, I, I think it's the winter harvest handbook that they're talking about. That That is, you think that's useful for home growers? Oh, those, so try that again. The Winter Harvest Handbook is very useful for home growers. Um, and, and it's, I could go on and on about how wonderful that is and how much you can do in the winter um, with that. So, so if you get that, and I think the library actually has it, I think I've we taken definitely. it out. Um, it's a very useful book. Yes, I, yes. Great. 